Let I me mean, know when it's been. Okay, it's recording. Great. All right. All right. All right. Uh, hello. Uh, today, me and my fellow classmates, uh, George Martinez, Samuel Lecklin, Carlos Prada, and me, Anthony Turner, have been lucky enough to get the chance to conduct this interview. Um, we are students from California State University, Northridge, conducting an oral history on October 22nd, 2021 at uh, 1 p.m. We are interviewing the journalist, Jim Lemon, uh, via Zoom to learn more about his career in journalism. Uh, giving an interjection when one isn't needed and isn't necessarily indicative to the rest of the interview. Um, Jim Lemon is a highly experienced individual bringing, correct me if I'm wrong, nearly three decades of his mark into this industry, um, heading and managing many a newsroom, spanning across many different organizations, holding a dozen different titles. He's graced us with his presence today, allowing us to conduct this interview. Um, he currently believes that being a part of an industry that helps inform and enrich the lives of the community is an honor and a privilege and holds such values as teamwork, accountability, um, encouragement, service, differentiation, and competition to be of the utmost importance to himself and an industry like this. I introduce Jim Lemon. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Anthony. Thanks for having me. And I have to tell you, I was doing some mental math in my head just now. And um, the very first time I ever did a report for broadcast I was the year 1979. So that's over 40 years, I have to tell you. I'm like, wow, it is, it's been that long. Yes, it has. Yes, up to update that for decades. So that's that's a very long time in the industry. Indeed. So just like basic questioning, uh, where were you born? I am from Tucson, Arizona, and that is a one of the western cities that experienced explosive growth in the second half of the 20th century. My grandparents met and married there in the 1930s. So my father was born there as well. And then I came along, you know, 25 years after that. And it has been the place that has one of the most significant communities of my life, because not only did I have a lot of family connections there, but also my schooling is there. And I ended up spending almost 10 years of my career in Tucson as well. Nice, nice. And um, so spending your time in Tucson, like what exactly inspired you to become a journalist? And uh, did you face any challenges along the way of your journey or like schooling and throughout high school and stuff like that? You know, it's it's interesting. I started watching local news with my family. It was more common back then to have the TV news on. It's not as common as it now as it was then. So I became very fascinated and interested in it. And in high school, I got interested in both the uh, high school yearbook and the high school newspaper. So my earliest, ex uh, earliest experiences were on those kinds of high school journalistic publications. And so it started in high school with that interest in that field. And as I was kind of joking a moment ago about math, I'm, I got through my math classes, but there's a, a funny saying a lot of journalists will say, I was told there will be no math, which is completely not true. There is a lot of math in journalism. Uh, but at the time, it, it more molded with what I thought I was a very curious person. I asked a lot of questions. I was exposed not only to television news, but my family, we also took the daily paper. So I would read the newspaper. So I was already one of those people at an early age who was exposed to the news media in various forms. And so it became something that I was really interested in. And over the course of my high school career, I was able to get, uh, you know, in not internships, but visits like class visits, we would go to different places. And one of them was a the television program at Northern Arizona University up in Flagstaff at the time. And so that was my first time really inside a broadcast facility of any sort. And it was fascinating. And so that helped reaffirm that what I was looking at doing, I was 
was something that really made a sen- made sense and was I was very interested in. And so that's when I started college at the U of A in Tucson. It was indeed, um, I, I, I never questioned. I knew pretty much from the beginning that's what I wanted to do. And, and I have done pretty much my entire adult life. So I had a question in regards to like the beginning of like your journalism career. So mm-hmm. it was uh, like when and where, like were you hired for your first journalism job? So the, the 1979 that you're talking about was my father at that time in, in our lives lived in Yuma, Arizona. My father was a, a railroad conductor, Southern Pacific Railroad. And so he had left Tucson to go to Yuma because in Yuma he had more seniority. And so he could have a better position in his field based out of a smaller community in Yuma. And Yuma has, is a small television market. One of the smallest, not the smallest, but amongst the smallest. And so when I uh, was, and I, we weren't sure in my, in my family, if I was going to be able with scholarships and whatnot to be able to, and grants to be able to go to the university, or if I was going to have to start in community college. And so I was planning to start at Arizona Western College, which is in Yuma, has a radio station and was, I thought going to be a pretty cool place to go. And so while I was there over the summer, I took myself down to the local TV station. At that time, there was only one and knocked on the door, went into the office and asked, you know, for an interview to be for anything they might have. And the assignment editor, the person who kind of ran the day-to-day news operation interviewed me and said, I really can't give you any money. We don't have any paid jobs open, but if you want to intern here, uh, you can do that. And so I jumped on it. And so all summer, the summer of 1979, I interned at KYEL TV. Now the call letters have changed, but at the time, KYEL TV, the uh, NBC affiliate channel 13 for Yuma. And I learned you know, at the time, all of the basic building blocks of what it took in those days to, you know, produce local news on a television station in a smaller market in Yuma, Arizona, with the equipment that was available. And at the very end of it, I got to do a couple of on-air stories. So those are the first real, in fact, my story that I did was an airline that is no longer <laughs> much a long time gone called Cochise Airlines, and it had just started service between uh, Yuma and Phoenix. And so I had gone and I, I was with a regular reporter. And in those days, basically, the reporters would report two stories. And with me along, that made it a lot better. They could, you know, I could help shoot video for them, help carry the gear. Uh, and so the reporter said, hey, why don't when we get back, let's see if our boss, guy named um, Larry, would he let you do the story? Because I can do the other story. And I frankly don't remember what that one was, but we had been out shooting two different stories. And so he, and he went back and then the, the boss said, yeah, sure, go for it. So that became my first story that ever went on air. So it wasn't hard in the sense that it was, a, I, I guess, just a matter of knocking on the door and, and finding the right place at the right time. I will say that one thing that is true then and is true today is it's as much who you know as what you know. So that those contacts that I made at that summer internship for those two and a half months, and I, by the way, found out I was going to have enough, that I would, I would have enough in money in the form of grants and scholarships and whatnot to be able to go to the university. So I did not have to go to Arizona Western. So I knew that at the very end of the summer. But all the contacts that I'd made there allowed me to go back to that same television station every Christmas break, every summer, every spring break uh, in order to work there. And every other time I went back after that first summer, I was paid. It was minimum wage, four bucks an hour and later five bucks an hour. But it was opportunities to basically do things that my contemporaries at the time were nowhere near doing. So by the time I graduated in 1983, uh, with a BA in radio and television from the U of A in a minor in journalism, I was able to have almost a year's worth of experience collectively if you strung it all together from the last three and a half, uh, three, four years that I had been going through college. 
And so I went back and that's where I got my first full-time job was in that same station, even though I had applied at lots of other places as well, but it just made sense. I went back there and got hired on full-time and that kind of started the career was that whole experience. So I can't uh, sit here, Samuel, and tell you that it was hard, but it certainly was challenging in the sense that, you know, it, it was important to do things correctly and to get it right, not only from a standpoint of accuracy, but also from a standpoint of technical capability. And once you figured that out, and that came fortunately pretty easily to me, um, then it became more about just wanting to make sure that I was always improving, getting better, finding different ways to do things. And, you know, that experience of being at a professional, small but professional place put me in a, in a much better position coming out of college than, than many of my, uh, my contemporaries were in. That's um, okay. Yeah. And then, um, so you noted like in 1979, like I wasn't around back then. We weren't around back then. So like, um, like how is the technology like differing back then? Like, cause you noted how like um, certain yeah. things are different aspects as they are now. So. Sure. Okay. So uh 1979 was pretty much the completion of the transition for, for local news, for local journalism, from the old news film days to the news videotape days. So when I got to that television station, they still had an old film room, but they had, within the, the year or two before that, had modernized and made their uh, equipment video. They'd gone to videotape. And so it was the very beginning of that. So there was a lot of new experiences that were happening in television news at the time, because in the days of film, you had to take the extra time necessary to basically develop the film and get it out. And then you had to literally splice it to edit it and to put it ready to make it ready for air. And that obviously once you went into what was called ENG, electronic news gathering, all of a sudden you're basically shooting pictures on, on a videotape, similar to a cassette tape, just bigger. And now you had the ability to edit and not lose anything. You could edit it different times, different ways. You kept the original video and you just edited it onto a separate tape. And then that's the tape that was then used on, on the air. So it was, it was interesting to be there at the beginning of that new technology, which lasted for about 20 years before we went nonlinear, which is what you folks today are familiar with. You know, you know about Adobe Premiere and you know about fi maybe Final Cut Pro and other nonlinear systems, you know, iPhone, for example, I, I, iMovie, excuse me, those types of things. And even to this day, I bet if I was put in front of an old videotape editing system, I could probably pretty quickly within a few minutes, figure it out and start editing again on the old linear tape to tape ways of doing things. So that was interesting, being a part of that. Um, it was also a, a, a time because a lot of the people, the way it kind of usually works in our industry is the, the, the smaller cities, Yuma being among them, are where people begin their careers. Every once in a while, you'd come across someone who had been somewhere else. In our case, in Yuma, Arizona, you gentlemen may not know this, but it has both a Marine base and an Army proving ground. So it's got a very, and just not far away is a, is a Naval Air Facility in El Centro. So there's a lot of military in the area. And so there were not, not an, a small number of people who were coming out of the military and then would end up working if they wanted, if that was the career they wanted. And so they would come, so not quite right out of college, but mid-20s to maybe early 30s at the, at the oldest, or, which were many of those people, many of the folks there were, were starting out. So it was interesting to be around those folks and how they you know, came to be and, and what they did. Um, but it was also an, an experience to, to know, because by the time I graduated college, I had also had opportunities to do other internships at Tucson Television stations. And I ended up staying at one of them, KVOA, the NBC affiliate for much of my, my time in college there, uh, which was, of course, bigger, more professional, better equipment, more people, and learning and understanding that, okay, in our, in our industry, you start small, and it's 
somewhat primitive and then it gets a little more uh technologically improved as you get as you move further on and the way the television industry works the local television industry works is the company called nielsen which i assume you, you may have heard of it's basically the people who um run the ratings they are the ones who tell everyone in the media in television media okay x number of people watched you last night or x number of 25 to 54 men watched you last night and over time of course those services have, have improved as well but the nielsen people took the whole nation and basically cookie cuttered it into what are called dmas dominant market areas or market most of us call it our markets so in uh, my experiences in those very early days, my first market was the Yuma El Centro market. So that was Yuma County, Arizona and Imperial County, California. And then while I was interning, I was interning in Tucson, which was the Tucson market, which was basically all of Southeast Arizona and a little sliver of uh, Southwest New Mexico. So you learn those things as you go along. The biggest market in the country is New York City. The second biggest is Los Angeles. All of you are in the second biggest market in the country. Um, and in between, of course, is everywhere else, anywhere from Omaha, Nebraska, to Fairbanks, Alaska. I did say Nebraska. I did say that, yes. Uh, to Seattle, Washington, Reno, Nevada. You know, every, any place of any really significant size is a market. And the Nielsen people have said, okay, well, the people in these counties around that city are the ones who are, that's the one that goes for those TV stations serve those areas. And that's kind of the way it has worked. Um, the smallest one is Glendive, Montana, where no one knows where it is. It's basically East Central Montana, but it's the smallest TV market, whereas New York City is the biggest. Interesting. And then, um, so I'm just getting back on track here. Uh, so walk us through your like journalism career, like including um, K, uh, KYL like, TV, right? Sure. Uh, just okay. So far, like. Sure. Okay. Like, names so of agencies. You work right. For, you so all that. Yeah. I started in, in, like I said, working part time through college at KYEL TV in Yuma. Um, I interned all through college at KVOA TV in Tucson. And then went back to KYEL for my first full-time job out of college after I got my degree. I was there for like another year. And then as is common with people in our, my industry is then you usually look to go to a bigger place. And so you start shopping around looking for other opportunities. And in those days you found out about, there were these um, trade magazines where people would post their ads and those magazines usually showed up in every TV station in the country. And from that, you would then reach out and apply for a position and you either do it over the phone or you would do it by a mail. And I had learned about a position in Boise, Idaho. And so I applied for it. And at the same time, I learned that there was a, a position that was interesting, but not exactly what I was looking for at another station in the same place in, in Boise. So I sent, I, I made up two videotapes, which we call them our, our reels. And then I shipped them to both of these two TV stations. And the one of the place that I really wanted the job, the job they had open was what I wanted. Um, I, you know, I used the best quality tape that I had with the, you know, that had the, it was newer. It didn't have a lot of breakup on it. It was, you know, and then the second tape, which was one of my older ones is the one that went to the other station. So uh, a few weeks go by and I get a phone call and it's from the news director, which is the boss of the station that I was really not that interested in. <laughs> and we start talking. And of course, as we're talking, I realize that this is a really good newsroom. This is a good operation, this place. And so he starts talking, well, would you want to come up and interview with us? And I'm thinking, well, yeah, of course I would. And so he goes, okay, well, we'll get on. And we'll tell you about, we'll, we'll pay for it. We'll fly you up. And I'm like, wow, I'm being flown to Idaho. And so one morning at like six in the morning, I got up early and went down to the airport in Yuma got on a plane and two plane connections later landed in Boise, Idaho. 
and went to the station and I was really impressed and I knew that it'd be a great place to work and it would be a really great uh, opportunity for me because there were a lot more seasoned people there um, and it was a company that really you know invested in their product and they really they did what they needed to do to cover the, the local news of Idaho and so I came back home to Yuma and then maybe less than a week later he called and offered me the job and I took it and so here I am I'm leaving Yuma and I'm going to Boise Idaho okay so I start packing up my house and I might call it my apartment. It was not a house. It was a, basically a large studio apartment. And on the and I had my phone still plugged in. And literally the last day, in fact, I was probably less than an hour from getting in the car and starting away with all my stuff in a U-Haul trailer that I had behind my car. And the phone rings and I answer it. And it's uh, the guy at the other station that I'd sent the tape to. And I had to tell him, uh, I'm really sorry, but I just got hired at Channel 7. And he paused. And he goes, you mean here? And I went, yeah. Oh, my God, you're going to come back and haunt me. And I'm like, okay, sorry. So, you know, it was interesting. So it was kind of, you know, nice ego boost to know that, hey, the tape got there and it was okay. And but, you know, a little, little late. So I ended up at the other station. And when I got in the station, by the way, it was KTVB, which stood for Treasure Valley Broadcasting, which... Many people don't know this, but Boise, the city of, is in the Treasure Valley. So it's KTVB, which is a dominant then and now dominant local news affiliate for that market, NBC affiliate, Channel 7. And I ended up, it was great being there because it really was the big news station in the market. And ultimately, I was better off being there. And I learned so much more than I had, I would have, if I had gotten that other job at the other station in Boise. And the news director was more senior. The assignment editor was a very senior person. He'd been there. He was probably in his, at the, even then, he was probably in his mid 40s, which, you know, to a 20 something was, well, that guy's been around a while. And he had been. Um, and, but some of the reporters had been there a long time. And so there, and some of the photographers had been there for many years. So there was a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. And so I very quickly, up to, you know, I stepped up my game because I knew I needed to, to be able to fit in here and to do well here. And I remember it was probably about less than a year after I got there was the first election and reporters were given counties. My county happened to be the one that was right next to uh, where Boise is located called Canyon County. It's where the, the cities of Nampa and I believe Caldwell are. Well, I made a point because I knew this was coming. So I, I went over and I met with some people and I talked to people on the phone and I really did my homework on Canyon County so that on election night, I would be up to speed. And so election night came along. And one of the things that always happens on any election night, doesn't matter how modern the technology, something gets delayed. And so I'm in the studio. I have my little, I'm Canyon County and two of my colleagues are two other counties. And then they had reporters live out at um, the Republican and the Democratic parties for that night. Well, after a while, they, you know, there's nothing more for them to say there other than that, that, you know, okay, we've talked about all that's going on back to you and we still have to fill time. Well, because I can talk pretty well and I had a pretty good sense of ad living, the anchor kept going to me because he knew I would go on for five, 10 minutes at a time. So and I did. Uh, and we got through the night and everybody was happy and we thought we did a good job in covering it. And we all high fived each other and, you know, off we went. Well, the next day, my assignment editor, the mid 40s guy, you know, comes over to me and he was kind of a gruff guy. And he goes, you know, I got some calls from people about you and talking about Canyon County. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, they just thought you were awfully, you know, you like spouting off like you knew everything. I said, well, was any of it wrong? And he went, no, it was all accurate. And I'm like, well, that's because I did homework. I prepared. He goes, yeah, yeah, okay. And so then he went back to his desk and I'm just like, you know, but fast forward a few months and this was a market where people would go out after work and, you know, go somewhere and enjoy adult beverages. And so that was happening one night and the, the older mid forties guy, we were sitting there, both of us had a beer and other people were around talking about other things. He goes, you know, you have really come along. 
And it was just, I mean, from this, this guy who's really gruff and everything it was kind of this huge compliment and like, wow. I mean, he's like, yeah, you're one of our best reporters. And I'm just like, you know, it just blew me away. And, but it, it reinforced to me that, Hey, you know, you do the work and you'll be able to, you know, go somewhere and you'll grow. And it wasn't long after that. I, I, the one thing that that job, and the reason I didn't take that originally want that station in that job is because it was reporter only. And in Yuma, I had both been an anchor, the weekend anchor and a reporter. And I love doing both anchoring and reporting, sitting on the desk and reading the news. And, and at smaller markets, you actually produce all of it. You put it all together. You're the one who makes all the decisions. You do all the writing. And it's not just sit on the set and talk. It's, it's a lot of work involved in it. And I wanted to go back to do that. And I was only getting to do that very infrequently in, in Boise as a, as a fill-in. And so an opportunity came up in uh, Reno, Nevada. And I went down and interviewed and got the, got the job. And so I literally made a lateral move in my case. It was about the same size community, but it was anchoring and a little more money. But it was really more about the fact that every, every Saturday and Sunday now I would be on the anchor desk and you know getting those skills more perfected so i went back and of course you know my my boss in in boise he knew that there that wasn't going to happen for me there because they already had long-term anchors and that's fine so he was very you know happy about for me and everything and we parted you know very amicably and i went down to reno and started working there and it was you know i will tell you that it the the station in idaho was a better station had more people better equipment more committed to news but I couldn't get what I really wanted, which was the, the time on the anchor desk. And I was able to get that in Reno. And so that's why I went there. I also, as it turns out, made um, some of the friends that I'm still with friends with today. So, you know, at least one of my lifelong friends, he and I competed against each other in Reno. We were on different stations and became friends um, off hours. Of course, never on hours. You know, that was very very brutal we had a fight with each other but off the air and behind the scenes we were friends and we still are today so that went on for a while and then out of the blue came an opportunity back in tucson and you know tucson was always the goal because that's home and i was able uh to get offered a position and i accepted it about a year i, I was in reno just under a year and that's a little less time than normal. Most time, most, most in those days, a year was kind of the minimum. I was doing a little less than the minimum. So, you know, in a perfect world, it would have been later, but that's when the job came open. And by this time, I now have more than three and a half years of experience under my belt from Yuma, Boise, and now Reno. I was in, I was in Boise for like a year and a half um, that, you know, and they, they hired me and I was a, I was a native. I was from there that knew people. So, I mean, for all those reasons, I became an attractive candidate for K-Gun, K-G-U-N TV, ABC affiliate. And that's, and I ended up there. My first day on the job was November election night in November of 1986, the year that Evan Meekham was elected governor in Arizona and which started a year of very interesting political coverage in the state of Arizona. And because I was brand new and they didn't really have anything for me. So I just was in the newsroom helping out on election night, which was very odd because normally I'm in the middle of it. I'm live somewhere or, you know, doing whatever, like I had done in Idaho. And so here I am and I'm now in Kagan, but it wasn't very long after that. I did take only a reporter position, but then a weekend anchor job opened up and they, I, they knew I was very interested in that. I auditioned with um, another person, got it, and then I did it for the next eight years. So Tucson was the market where I really, I would say, first I'm home, so I bought a house. I started, you know, I put down roots in the community. I um, went back to my the church I had been baptized in, and you know, and here I am, I'm back and and whatnot, you know, twenty plus years later. And started really just, you know, set, putting down roots and whatnot. And I really enjoyed it. And I really, you know, I got very good at covering the news. I had a beat, my, my two beats, actually. My first beat was education, uh, basically the, the, the public school systems. And there were a few of them. And then city government, Tucson city government. So I covered both of those things. I was a night reporter. So I did a lot of live shots at night and out on scenes of things or meetings and breaking news, spot news, accidents, fires, that sort of thing. 
and then I uh, on the weekends and then I produced and anchored on the weekends and co-anchored I co-anchored for like the first five years and then the last three I I ended up or two years I ended up solo anchoring by myself but and in that time the station picked up and moved to a brand new building so I went from one building to another which was really cool and you know and we grew as the city grew and we added more people and added more newscasts. We added a morning news. We added a midday news. We added uh, more on the weekends. We used to only do a 10. Then we started doing early and late news on the weekends. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a cool place to be. And, and I was pretty settled and I'm like, okay, well, if I go, what do I, what do I want to do next? If anything? Well, while I was at Kagan, they offered a educational assistance program and so I decided to go back to the University of Arizona. And while I'm working, and since I work nights, my mornings were all free. And so I went and I got myself a master's degree in journalism. It took about three and a half years. And I was, I'm so glad I did it. I, today, I would just, I think I would, just the thought of it makes me tired of doing all the work. But um, at the time, it was a lot, but I was younger and I could handle it. But I learned a lot and I went through some very interesting classes. And these are, you know, those upper level classes with the really good professors who can really challenge you intellectually and whatnot. And I remember one professor and it was a class and it was about political science. I did a journalism, but you still had to have a minor when you're getting a master's degree. And so my minor was, was political science. And I was in this, this poli sci class with this professor and we were talking about uh, motivations and mindsets and whatnot. And we got to talking about narcissists and what he was talking about. And it really, it, it, it rung a bell in my head. There had been this guy who had was arrested in, in Tucson uh, for murder. He had actually very brutally murdered. He'd like home invaded, broke into a house, tied them up, robbed them and then killed them before leaving. And my colleague had gotten an interview with him in jail. So I went and asked her, I said, do you mind if I make a copy of that? I want to show that in class. And she goes, yeah, sure. So I made a copy of it and went back with him and said, I have a, the interview we did in my TV station from this guy and what he had done and everything. And so we, he played it in class and it was like, everyone was in rap and, you know, was, wow, this is, and it was, and it was classic. This guy was a classic narcissist and he was, you know, he killed basically to feel. And there, that is, you know, the, the people who are like that. And that was something that was really interesting in that classroom and, and whatnot. But it was, so those types of things and, and, uh, and other classes, I, you know, it was fa fascinating to learn about the, the political systems in Mexico much more clearly than I had known before and, and things like that. So I really enjoyed the whole process. I did my thesis on video and that was really great. And I took a photographer from the station. We, we on my dime, we went back to Washington, D.C., and we interviewed people from the FCC and from media advocacy groups. And we basically were talking about at that time, the relative today, it's all different. But in those days, it was just the very beginning of the ownership rules being changed and allowing t uh, companies to own more than just a handful of TV stations. In those days, it was seven. You can only own seven radio, seven TV, uh, seven AM, seven FM, seven television stations. So 21 max. And today, of course, as we all know, that's <laughs> nowhere near what the, what the rules are today. But that was the beginning of it. So it was a, I did a, what is now a very outdated thesis you know, for my master's degree. Um, and while I was there, I had been doing this now for a long time. I got my degree so I could go back and teach. And I did do some, some teaching at the U of A. I did some adjunct lecturing, which was great. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I'm like, OK, well, what do I want to do next? And so I started thinking, well do I want to uh, just keep doing what I'm doing? Because in my station, I was the weekend anchor. Our, our main anchor had been there before I got there and was going to and basically retired there probably 15 years later. So I knew that I was, if I wanted to stay, I was going to pretty much have to stay where I, right where I was, or the only other option internally was to go into management. So I started thinking about it and I started having conversations with uh, the existing people. And the one who was there, uh, who is still to this day, a mentor and a friend, he ended up the news director, he offered me a position in management. But it was just I was I literally had like a semester and a half left to go on my master's. And I'm like, I can't fin I have to finish that. And so he got it and understood. So 
It's one of those, okay, next time. Well, the next time was when he left and they brought in somebody from one of our sister stations at the time. And then that person and I talked and then I became the executive producer. So I moved from weekend anchor reporter to the number two position in the newsroom as executive producer. And I did that for like three more years. So I was there for like a total of nine. So about six and a half years on the air and then three as the EP. And that was a great experience because, you know, I learned lots of new things, lots of, uh, you know, when you're a manager, you have to think more about not only just the bigger picture of everything, of how you're going to, you know, make the sausage every day of the, of the local news, but also how are you going to staff people? Who's going to be on the schedule? How are you going to, you know, get the people to cover for somebody who's on vacation or ill and all of those types of managerial type things that really was learning on the job. And I'm, but because I had been there as long as I had, and I had a great reputation, even if I wasn't the perfect manager from the beginning, people knew that I was a good journalist. And so, you know, it allowed, it gave me a little cushion to learn how to uh, get there as a manager. So the next opportunity came and it was within our same company. And we had, my company had just purchased two stations in Kansas and the sales manager for the entire state of Kansas called me up and he had been our sales manager in Tucson and he had gone there as a promotion to a bigger operation where he was doing the whole region and he goes we're looking for they're looking for a news director at the station at Topeka and I'm like oh really and he goes yeah and I think that would be really good for you I'm like okay so I they flew me back I went there for my interview and got the job so I became my very first news director job was in Topeka Kansas at KSNT the um, NBC affiliate for that market, Channel 27. KGUN, by the way, was an ABC affiliate. So for all those years, I'd been an ABC affiliate. Way back in the beginning, I'd been at NBC affiliate. So now I'm back at an NBC affiliate in my first news director job in Topeka, Kansas. Smaller station, smaller staff, but we still did really well and put on some really good content. And I was very fortunate and there's some really good people there. And so we worked really well and I felt really proud of the work that we did. And we really had a, a good looking product there. This is getting back to the, it, it's about who you know, as much as what you know. So that job was partially, I mean, I didn't know the, the general manager, the guy that became my boss, but when he met me and he was, oh yeah, you, I can work with you. Okay, great. I'll hire you. Um, the next job was again, they called me and it was the one that had first offered me in Tucson who'd left to go to be a manager at one of our other stations and had then subsequently gone to one other station to become the top manager, general manager. And he called me up and he goes, Hey, I'm looking for a news director here in Honolulu. And I knew we'd owned a station there. I'd even seen the, the, you know, some video from there before. And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, would you be interested? I said, well, yeah, absolutely. I'd be interested. And so I flew to Hawaii. My first time ever flying to the, the islands was for a job interview, spent a week. I stayed at that hotel called the Ilikai, which is, if you remember the old original Hawaii Five O, not the new one, the old one, way back with Jack Ward. And at the very beginning when they zoomed in on him at the beginning of the show, that's the hotel I stayed in, which was a nice hotel. Very nice. So I went there as a news director. I was there for four years. And that was a station that my company, honestly, candidly, had really ignored and let it just kind of fall apart so with my boss who had been my news boss in tucson now i'm the news boss and he's my boss as the general manager in honolulu and together with other managers we we rebuilt the station and it was a really long long slog took a long time and a lot of effort but we were finally able to really bring it back to where it was a, a a viable competitor in the market again And so that was great. We also got lucky and had an Olympics that CBS, this was a CBS affiliate, KGMB. And I think the GMB stood for someone's name from way back in the fifties when the station first went on the air, but we, we were able to make it a real competitor. And then we got an Olympics month and got a lot of eyeballs on us. A lot of people watching who wouldn't normally watch it. So that really helped kind of elevate the station back to, uh, where it was being seen again as a, because it had been, you know, a long time ago, a really strong station, but it had gotten weak over the years because it had been ignored. And so we, we did the care and feeding to bring it back. Then the company uh, decided to sell its television group. 
And so, and this is what, this is a reality in my industry is that managers of television stations tend to be the ones who are the most at risk when sales happen um, in broadcasting. So new ownership came in, new manager came in. Uh, it, we got along okay for a while, but after a while she decided she wanted a new person. So I was, you know, nicely shown the door. And so I was out of work for a while and I ended up, and this is the first time where I got a job where I didn't know the person at all. And, and it was KOVR, the CBS affiliate in, San, in Sacramento, California. So I left the islands and moved to California, to Northern California. And Sacramento was a big city, bigger than Honolulu, actually. But it was owned by, it was one of the smaller stations. It, it, it wasn't one of the, it didn't really compete as strongly as the ABC and the NBC affiliate did in that market. But it was a really great place to be. And for me, it was the biggest at that point station I'd ever worked for. And I ended up being there for about four years and doing really well. And we figured out the right strategic positioning to be in. And we leveraged our strengths and didn't try to be what we weren't. And, you know, we had competitors who had a lot more resources than we did. And so we did the kind of coverage that worked for the kind of resources that we had available to us. And we did really well. And the sales department was very happy and the ownership was very happy and we were doing great. And then that ownership again sold. They sold the station to a network. They sold it to CBS actually. And it is still KOVR to this day is owned by CBS now. And CBS came in and while I had pretty good relationships with people at CBS, they still had, they, they decided they wanted a clean house. And so again, and it's not a personal thing. It's not like you're horrible. It's we just want our own people. And so again, I'm the, the, the phrase in our industry is I'm on the beach. I'm looking for the next job. I'm not working right now. I'm, I'm out of a job. And so I'm on the beach. And I was fortunate this time to be able to get something quicker. It only was, it was like about six months in Hawaii. And it was like three. Yeah, three in, in Sacramento. And in that situation, I did not again know the, the manager who hired me. But he knew somebody who knew my boss who had been there until the sale and got a good recommendation. And so again, there's that who you know thing. And it came back around and so I got hired. And I was in uh, at WITI in Milwaukee, the Fox affiliate, and it was owned by Fox. So I'm now going to an o and It's called an owned and operated station, o and And I was there for about six years, a little over six and a half. Uh, that was a great opportunity at that station. We basically went through the conversion into high definition and to digital and to, you know, going away from analog to nonlinear and everything. And so that was kind of our, you know, my learning curve of going from the, the old days of videotape to the new days of, of, of digital and, and HD and all of that. But we did it really well. And, and our station did, we won awards and, we did well in the ratings. And so it was a really good place to be and whatnot. My boss, there was a, a football coach and uh, he decided, and this happens sometimes. This is the first time I got, I got let go without there being a change in ownership, but it was just one of those where, you know, he decided he wanted some new blood. And so he made the decision again. I was, you know, they did it nicely. There was a going away. I, you know, there was some severance pay involved and whatnot. That's when I ultimately ended up here in uh, Santa Barbara. And I took this position because A, it's owned by a private family and they're great people, which is unusual these days. That's very unusual in, in the current industry. And KEYT is the ABC affiliate for Santa Barbara. And the market here, all of these are different markets. The market here, Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County. So for the first year, year and a half here, I'm basically the news director of the ABC affiliate. My company had been working and talking to other owners. And so they ended up purchasing the Fox affiliate for this market. And then we also worked out an agreement where we bought the physical assets of the CBS affiliate. And then we programmed for them and we managed for them. But all of the news employees were part of our company. So I went from being the news director of the ABC affiliate to being the news director of the ABC, CBS, and Fox affiliates. 
that happened about seven years ago, I want to say. And then about two years ago, we actually did some switching and we now outright own the CBS affiliate. And I, but my role has really not changed, but the methodology and how they put the signal out has changed a little bit. Um, but I'm, but, you know, we are a big three station um, newsroom. We have people based in Ventura. We have people based in Santa Barbara and we have people based in Santa Maria. So it's a big operation, but it's been, really been a great place. And in March of this year, I will have been here nine years. And that's a lot long winded path of my career. I hope that all made sense. <laughs> Oh, very interesting, very interesting. A living part of it. So throughout your career, you've been working in many agencies, essentially like all over the US. So if you had to narrow it down to one, which one would you say was like your favorite to work for? Which agency? It would be Tucson and here. So I have to I have to pick two. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Tucson because it's my hometown. Here because it's such a great group of people and it's really good ownership. Um, there is something unique about, I mean, and we're very, we're rare that we're owned by a private family. Now that can be bad. You can have a bad family owner, but ours is not. Ours is an excellent family owner. They believe in the technology. They believe in, in covering news and being a good part of the community. And so we get the resources we need to do a really good job of, of fulfilling our mission. So I would definitely put this place first, but I'd put Tucson a close second simply because it's home. Um, what are some of the major news stories you personally covered in Southern California? So are all of you Southern California folks? Yes. You all? Okay. So you obviously then remember the Thomas fire and what afterward, and this was three years ago now, it's 2017, I think, 2018, 2017, I think. Anyway, that was the fire that started north of Ventura and it burned westerly. And it literally got to the point where they had to evacuate the city of Santa Barbara. Um, so that was a big deal for us because we, we of course covered it every step of the way but when it got close we had to go on the air and stay on the air and this happened twice so over a period of like i think it was 26 hours once and 24 hours another time but we just stayed on and it was hard it's really difficult to you know television is linear if you think about it you know we have all been talking now for not quite an hour um, me doing most of the talking, but can you imagine me having to talk and talk and talk, multiply what, what we've done so far times 24 or times 26. So with, and obviously in television, well, you got to have video, you need to have live shots, you need to have all of the various tools of the trade that come with the actual implementation and you and, and doing of, of TV news. And this team did such a remarkable, marvelous job at three in the morning, it was still burning. Nothing had really changed, but it was still burning, but it was right on our back door. What I explained to folks at the time was, we're like a nightlight. People are sleeping and not very well, and they're waking up at 2.15 in the morning, and they need to know what's going on. And so they turn on the TV, and there we are. We're on. We're live. And they watch us for a few minutes. They, can, they absorb that it's not I don't, I'm not in any imminent danger. They can turn it off and go back to sleep. And then when they wake up at four in the morning, oh my God, where, and they can turn it on again and we're still there. So we became kind of a nightlight for the community during all of that. It was very, very hard, but yet very important. And the community really recognized it because for months and months and months, more than a year plus afterward, we heard a lot of you know, feedback from people going, we can't believe you did that for us and being, being there for us. But it was such a great thing to be doing what we're supposed to do, doing it well and, and providing something that's so essential and so important for our, our community. Now you may or may not remember that it was less than a month after the fire 
was the big rainstorm that caused the Montecito mudslides that killed 24 people. That was basically, and that was a much more synopsized, short burst of, of coverage, but it was again overnight into the early morning hours and then all day where we realized that something really, really bad had happened when the rains hit and, and caused the, these mudslides to come tumbling down into Montecito. And it was, it was horrible, but yet we had, to, we had a job to do. We had to maintain our composure, even though some of our people were literally seeing you know, dead bodies in the street. Uh, but it was important that we do our job, do it well, and, and be there for our community, and we did. So th that, that would be, and it's relatively recent in my career, but I would say that was probably one of the most important uh, stories that I've ever been a part of. And it was, but there have been so many. I mean, that, that, that was such a, I mean, the, the fire was a slow moving car crash is what it was really. The mudslide was an instant in the moment, but we were, we knew how to do it. We were, we had planned, we knew the rain was going to be bad. So we put people in place and we, we got through it and we did a really good job. And the, fo <laughs> the folks who work here, have all now learned what it's like to have to do you know, sustaining coverage whenever something is so bad that you have to stay on with it. We've had others. Uh, we've had other fires that have come along. We had the um, early, fairly early in my, my time here, we had the UCSB mass shooting. So that was, a, a, you know, a horrible situation, but we've had different things that have happened along the way. And um, our team knows how to do it. The institutional knowledge has stayed because we're very fortunate here to have people who are longtime employees, people who want to be here. And even though we're a smaller market, they, they want to be a part of this community. And so they have stayed here longer than what normally happens in, in, in small market TV. I've had them along the way, though. I had a, I had a really bad um, mass shooting in Hawaii at a postal, at a postal facility. That happened. We had a couple of, you know, significant things. When uh, the election of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor, the recall of the, the governor of California way back in the early 2000s, when, that, when it was successful, this time it wasn't, that time it was, that was a really big story to be a part of. So there've certainly been along the way, lots of big stories and lots of things. As an anchor, I still remember the night that I, as back in Tucson, where I had to anchor the coverage of a, um, execution. And I didn't have to, I wasn't the guy on the scene. I was just the one in the studio and tossing to the reporter and talking with the reporter and then, you know, wrapping it all up afterward. But that was something that was a big deal at the time. And so things like things happen over the course of time. And that's just the way human history works and whatnot. Our job is to try to do it well, being as clear, try not to throw our opinions into it too much. Although sometimes, I mean, when, you know, people die in a mudslide, that's a horrible thing. And you're not going to get away from being a human being in that kind of a situation and you shouldn't. So I would say those are you know, some of the things, but, but the biggest one I'm going to put down is the Thomas fire simply because of, it was a team effort. It took everybody to make it work and to go make it successful. And they really did. I, I had two questions, like back to back, about like the major news stories you covered in Southern California. And my sure. first one would be, uh, like in regards to the mass shooting at UCSB, I was wondering, like, were you physically at the scene, like where that event unfolded? And like, can you like describe like the environment? Like, was it a lot of SWAT cars, helicopters flying around? Like, was it noisy with parents and everything? Like, if you can please describe that scene. Okay, sure. First, no, I was not. I was um, actually on vacation. I was in San Diego that night. And I got phone calls from my anchors. They said, this has happened. And I'm like, okay. And they told me what they were going to do. And that was okay. And I got in the car and started heading back. And I got back here in the early morning hours. But what, what I've been told, though, was that it was chaotic. Yes. And it was frightening. And we had people, we had a young lady uh, with us who had been, uh, was, an in, was she an intern? And she was a part-time person, I believe. And she was a member of a sorority at UCSB and talking to her friends and who they're, they're inside and they don't know what's happening and being told to shelter in place and all that. It was absolutely a chaotic scene. 
Um, it happened relatively quickly. I mean, I think it only took place over the course of maybe two or three hours and he was, he killed himself. But it was very, very chaotic. Yes, and there were hell. You're all everything you're describing absolutely happened and was all was all there. So the and because there were multiple scenes, and by you know like the next day, they didn't they hadn't yet gotten the time timing of everything together yet. And our folks who were on scene, and I'm I'm now back, and so I'm now working with our people behind the scenes here, and uh one of our reporters called in i have found a scene where there are bodies that were not known about N nobody had known about this location that they were at ultimately it turns out it's where his roommates were so that basically what we didn't know at the time though was this was his first place where he killed people before he moved on to shoot and kill others around the community but nobody knew that at the time. And so I remember how important it was and how careful we were being because this whole community is the whole, I mean, all of Santa Barbara, of course, is shocked and can't believe this happened and whatnot, but not being able to put in context yet what this scene was, the, the apartment complex, that was something that was very important. And that's where I would rely, I relied a lot on just years of experience in doing these things and about there are things that you can say and then things that you don't say you don't speculate unnecessarily and we didn't know what this was we didn't know where this all fit into the puzzle yet but we did know that it was involved that he was in, it was a scene that he had been at and we knew that there were fatalities so we went on with it carefully very methodically we didn't speculate i'm literally in the control room in the ear, you know talking with the, one of these things into the ear of the of the anchor and the reporter okay let's be careful about don't say the, say this don't say that and sort of and it was really important because once something like this happens and you get past the initial like the scene is 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 no longer active the actions that were taken horrific as they were are over now it's about how do we continue to put it together understand it but yet do it in a way that is professional but yet also you know not grisly and and not trying to make it so that it looks like we're reveling in gore and death because that's not at all what we're about in local news so we did and i was really proud of the team for how we did and put those elements together as they were because this is all happening in real time you know when you look back on it four years later now oh you can okay first he killed his roommates then he went off and he did this and he did that and, you know he wrote his manifesto and then he did all the other things but the manifesto came out that second day and we found it and started going through it and being very careful about what we were using in it because we have it we know what it says but we're being very judicious in picking out the parts of it that we start talking about and trying to be very, per, uh, what's the right word? I'm trying to think of the right word for this. We wanted to be thoughtful and we wanted to be um, careful and, com and con contribute to understanding why, as opposed to the prurient things that he was writing about, about how he wasn't able to get girls to like him. I didn't give it at the time, I still remember this, I'm like, it's important that we put that in context. I don't care that the guy couldn't get a, get a girlfriend, but I do care how that led him to do what he did. So we need to put this information into that kind of context. And, and that's the kind of finesse that happens in a breaking story like that. It happens in any story, really, but in real time and when something is so important and so significant, it really does become essential to figure out ways to do that on the fly that are that help people understand what's going on give them context give them perspective but yet at the same time don't start dragging it down into just you know gutter content content and things like that so that was a big deal that night yes and i'm sorry what was the other part of your i'm sorry samuel what was the other part of your question yeah so the other part was i was just gonna ask about the refugio beach oil spill yes so okay yeah, I was just going to ask, what was it like covering that story? And like, were you on it for an extended period of time? We were. Uh, that one came in 
uh, as a like, there's some oil smell out at Refugio Beach. And so off we went and sent a crew to go investigate it. And all of a sudden we're getting hearing back. This is bad. This is bad. Hey, guys, you know, this is this is not just some little thing. So we're very quickly you know, mobilizing resources behind the scenes on the air and on digital. We're just reporting what we know. There has been some sort of a spill out of Refugio, near Refugio State Beach, and they're still trying to investigate what happened. And here's the, the, what we know. But as time goes by, it just becomes clearer and clearer that this is a really bad oil spill. And what I think we, what we definitely did, not what I thought, what we actually did in that period of time was, again, go with what we know and continue to enhance and, and add to it. I did send more, like, for example, I sent anchor Beth Farnsworth out to that scene once we realized how big of a deal it was. I needed somebody on scene who could really bring that kind of perspective to it and knew the community well enough. So we started sending more senior people to the scene so that we knew that we'd be covered with people who were very good at what they did and using the best folks that you have available in, in the resources that you have at hand. So it took by the, by the, that was around one, one ish in the afternoon, by that afternoon, by the evening, by the time the five and, five and six o'clock news hit, we knew what we had and we knew it was really bad. Then it became about making sure that we were staffing it because this becomes a slow moving, ongoing developing crisis. People, one of the things that, that we did before others was don't go out there and try to clean it up yourself. We literally, I, I couldn't believe how no one else and the law enforcement finally, hey, folks, stop, go away, don't come here. We, we can't, you can't help us. You'll hurt more than help. That was something that one of our reporters very correctly saw and made a, made a big story for us, a major coverage of it before it was really generally known. But it also was something that became then part of our coverage, which is this is the place where the, the 1969 oil spill happened here in Santa Barbara. This is the place that was the beginning of the environmental effort of the modern era. People look at what happened back then as that was what really started the, the people who have to the, you know, the Greenpeace movement and all of those types of things. And here it is happening again. And in those early days, we didn't know if it was going to be as bad as what happened in Santa Barbara in 69. Turns out it did not, but it was bad enough. It wasn't great at all. It was a really bad situation for that relatively compact area. They were able to keep it contained, luckily. So that became important to be able to provide that perspective, that context, but yet at the same time, you have this community that is all in on environment and protecting the wildlife and the flora and the fauna. And we had to make sure that we were reflecting all of that in our coverage because we're the local station. The networks are going to come in and do the really big picture story as they always do. And that's fine. And, you know, God love them for that. But our job is to make sure that we make it relevant to our audience. And we know that includes a lot of people in this area who are very concerned about issues of environmentalism. Just a few weeks ago, we did a story about I think it was Exxon Mobil. Yeah, Exxon Mobil, who are still trying to get approval to use trucks to get oil out of a processing plant that has been affected because of that oil spill. So that story, even today, lives on locally. No one else is doing that story other than those of us here in this market. But it is important for our people here because who wants all those, and a lot of people don't want those trucks full of oil going up and down the freeway. Ultimately, they were denied. So they won't be, it won't be happening. But it could have been. And that's the part of, of why what we do is so important. And um, you touched on like many of the uh, like tragic stories so far. And um, uh, you also mentioned about like the human experience and just how events will always happen and how it's your job to, um, and your fellow coworkers jobs to analyze and view um, these events. So yeah, uh, 
how um so like analyzing the world how has the world changed from when you started your career until now social media and the digital platforms that we all now take for granted have dramatically changed the conversation before social media in an analog world if people wanted to share something they didn't have a lot of ways to do it yes they could reach out to a television station that yes they could reach out to a journalist and maybe get coverage on something that might be in print or on a broadcast but people didn't have the ability to self publish to self promote so when those opportunities started coming along and it was really in the mid 90s when AOL came along first and uh, and net um what was it called CompuServe and Netscape I think yeah Netscape and CompuServe and AOL all of a sudden people started having more outlets it, to share information to to communicate with other people and some of that is is as, as cool as people who love to look at cat videos but a lot of it is people who are interested in setting up uh, things that are would be considered insurrection that has changed dramatically the culture and the ability of people to a communicate with each other but b to be able to understand each other it's still possible for people to understand each other but it's harder to necessarily understand maybe a, a different point of view a different perspective they've always been there people have always disagreed there have always been political disagreements and philosophical disagreements but the ability to bring them into a larger where more people can be involved in those conversations wasn't wasn't there so it's going to i don't know where this will go i don't know where all of that will take us as a as a society and as a group of people maybe it will be that the irl in real life versus the online lives will continue to be separate mostly separate and they'll only break through when something really significant happens like what happened in washington back in january maybe it'll only happen through elections and whatnot i don't know but it is different and it is something that you know you gentlemen are all it's been your whole life you've you've had pretty much and it's for those of us who are so much older it is indeed a change i think i'm always i'm 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 kind i'm pretty much a glass half full kind of guy and i i think that as time goes by people are smart enough and and responsible enough to realize you know while we certainly have these abilities to do things do we necessarily want to and are they the right thing to do just because you can do something doesn't mean you should you could make that argument about mass destruction i mean since 1955 or something the the world's had the, had the ability to destroy itself it has but it hasn't done it because hopefully smarter people have come along and have prevented that from happening so i i think that we have a good shot at being able to figure out ways to make our way through these types of situations and there are always going to be people out there who you know disagree and are disagreeable but they're not necessarily going to be the ones who are going to be making the, the decisions and and have the all the leverage i don't think that's going to happen i hope it doesn't happen it's a hard question to answer to be real honest with you because it's so it's just so different and we don't yet know exactly where things are going to go and what not um, we we have a lot of you know societal issues we have the issues of homelessness we have the issues of cost of uh, housing the just the, the what it costs to live 
when I went to college, you know, guys, I with because I was, you know, I came from a family of really modest means. So I had grants. The, they were the predecessors of the Pell Grants. But those grants and some scholarships are what I was able to then, you know, start right away at the university instead of at, at that community college, like I told you about. But either way, when and I also got, you know, part time jobs, of course, all through college. By the end of the end of it, I was I had no debt. I was able to just go out and start and I had a debt of a car, but that was, and which was a big deal at the time, but I didn't have the kind of debt that students face th these days. And, and, a, and the house that I bought when I first got back to Tucson back in 1987, it was in 87 when I got the house, it was $60,000. Wow. Today that's a car, a nice car, but a car, you know? So, so things have changed in that regard as well. And, um, it's obviously going to take a lot of, uh, I think, people working collectively together and continuing to do the right things for the right reasons and having a, a, a reasonably good sense of ethical right and wrong uh, for civilization as a whole, communities in general, journalism specifically, to continue to be able to do the right things and to be able to do its role uh, to inform and to educate people. Here's something you may, I don't know if, I'd be curious if you guys have talked about this in some of your classes, which is until the turn of the century, the 1900 turn of the century, journalism was really not all about being un, uh, unbiased. From the beginning of our country, journalism was a, was a for-profit industry, usually with very specific points of view, and that's what the people back in those days, they published what was their perspective of the world. And then other people would publish theirs and then they would make their money, you know, selling it to people and getting people to, to glob onto it. And it was the, it was the take of the, uh, of the mass print media, turn of the century again. You know, when, when, when printing presses got a lot better and when they could use that really cheap, flimsy newsprint, but that still worked well for, for a newspaper. When that came along and all of a sudden you could print more, you could print more content, you could do it faster and it was cheaper. So now you could sell the newspaper at a much lower rate. You could advertise a lot more. You could reach the masses. And that at first, of course, they were all muckrakers and they all up. And still to this day, there are papers, New York Post being an example for that are all about, you know, getting your attention and having a point of view and kind of charging off in whatever direction editorially. But, but that change, that broadening of the ability to communicate through the print, through print media, allowed for the more modern form of journalism to grow, which was the, let's keep the editorial pages separate, let's have news that's just unbiased and you know, presents different sides of an issue and whatnot. And then we'll have separate pages that are for people who are, you know, advocating one way or another on an issue. And that was a relatively modern thing. So, you know, we're a hundred years into having more unbiased journalism. So it's still a relatively new, relatively new thing, but it has, to, in my belief, it has to stay that way because if we slide back toward everybody's just in their own silos and whatnot, it won't be helpful. In those days, it was really only the wealthy who were able to even have access to the media. Uh, if anybody else, they got access by something that was posted on a on the side of a wall. They didn't. It wasn't delivered to them back before the mass media came along. So that really made a change. And oh, and also, let's face it: way back in the 1800s, there were a lot of folks who couldn't vote. People who didn't own land. People who weren't white. People who weren't we're not men, you know, things have changed a lot and we have democratized and, and, and brought a lot of change to those who can be, who are a part of the, of the American democratic and you know, government processes that we have. So things that things have gotten better. So I think though, that we have to continue though, to be as broad and try to remain unbiased so that we can be presenting different points of view as much as we can. I realize it may be start to get a little more, oh, that's old fashioned, but I don't, I think that's kind of essential for success in the long run, especially with the kind of mass media that we today have, which is light years ahead of what they had way back when, you know, the penny press first came along.
Mm -hmm. Um, did you ever have any second thoughts about being a journalist? Like, was it too much sometimes or like maybe you thought of trying something new? You know, it's interesting. I, not really, as far as the, the, the bottom line question. No, uh, I have always found that the high parts of the knowing that you have really helped where you clearly done and provided content that people gave them information and whatnot. It's a great feeling. So after the Thomas fire and the mudslides, a group in Santa Barbara called CADA, and I apologize, I don't remember CADA's, what it stands for, but they have a, a big award thing every year. It's quite a whole, you know, foofy, foofy thing they do here. It was at the Ritz Carlton and we were honored our station was honored. And so my boss and me and 10 other members of the team, we all went to this event, and sat at a table. Food was great, by the way. I had a prime rib. It was delicious. Oh, no, it's filet mignon. And it was really good. Uh, and, you know, they had a little cocktail party beforehand. And everybody's all dressed up in really fancy clothes and everything. But when we got, the, we all went up on stage to be honored. Everybody at our table. And my boss, made a speech and you know talked about why we did what we did and how we're here to serve the community and blah 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 and this is a room of like three or four hundred people and everyone got up and had this big mat this big standing ovation and it, i almost got a little verklempt when one it happened because you're looking out at all these people and this is the you know the top echelon of santa barbara applauding us it's weird. It was so different. I mean, you like in your mind to think you're really doing something that really is effective for the community and helping and being a good part of the community. But this is a tangible example of it. And, and with the, all the movers and shakers, it was, I'll never forget it because it was such a, I mean, and it shouldn't matter, you know, that these, these, all these rich and fancy people were really impressed with what we did. Yes, it was hard and I'd still do it again. I'd still do it the same way if it happened again. I hope it doesn't, but if it did, we would. But it was really kind of cool at the same time to have that kind of tangible uh, response. So it, I, I was glad to do it and I don't see myself changing careers. And I realize that I'm unique in that regard. I, when I got the master's degree, it was that, well, what'll be my backup if I, you know, and I'll go, I'll go be a teacher. I'll go teach. That's what I'll do. And I have done it. I did it in Tucson. I also did it uh, in Honolulu at a college out there too. But I got to tell you, I, while I enjoyed it and whatnot, it didn't like drag me away from this. It didn't, oh, I've got to go. Those are greener pastures. I'm going there. So, so I, no, I, I don't see myself really going off and doing anything else. I'm also now, for better or for worse, <laughs> uh, in a, a place where I'm less than 10 years from retirement. So uh, I'm 59. I'll be 60 in December. So if I go to 67, which is when your um, Social Security kicks in, <laughs> you know, that's a seven years and a, and a couple of months from now. That's less than, you know, less than a decade from now. And it, with every passing day, it gets closer and closer. And I just don't see myself going off and doing doing something else other than what I've been doing this whole time. And if it does go that way, I'll be really lucky because of being able to be a part of this kind of industry and being and watching it do what it has done as far as its changes and its technological uh, improvements or not. <laughs> I guess you could argue that either way. Uh, it, it's really something that's I'm really I feel very fortunate to be able to do it. I, I really, you know, you guys, I, I, I don't know how, how hard it's going to be for you, you know, just getting out of college, getting started, getting, you know, a, a job. If you have, you know, the, the student debt, if that is an issue, I don't know. But if it is, I'm like, I really hope that it gets, you know, that the, that the world and our, our country, that we get to a point to where folks who want it, who want to take on you know, careers like this, you can do it and you can do it in ways that you're not going to be basically poor your whole life and whatnot. You know, yes, I had to go into management before I really made any decent money. That's true. But, and even then it wasn't right away. It was down the road. It was like three steps in before anything really bigger money-wise started happening. 
And to this day, I mean, I, you know, I could be making a lot more if I had gone into other corporate fields, a lot more than when I, I do. I make enough to get by and I have a, I own something. So I own one piece of property and that's fine. That's all it has to be. I mean, that's kind of the American thing, right? But, um, but at the end of the day, it's like, you just wonder about um, one of our anchors, uh, he and his wife just um, announced they're expecting an, a child. And I, saw, I started thinking about, you know, what are 20 years from now? That'll be like 2044, 2041. And what will the world be like in 2041? And will, you know, what will it be like to go to college? What will it be like to buy a house in 2041 compared to what it's like today in 2021? And what it was in 20, 2001 and 91 and, and whatnot. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying either. But other than the fact that... Um, I just think that it's a, I still think it's a great field and, and I, I cannot see myself doing something else. If I had to, of course I would, but fortunately I have not had to do something else. Um, other than the award that you uh, got from Kata, um, what other awards have you won? Uh, I saw that question that you guys sent me. And so, and I already told you about my favorite story. And so I brought this little prop along to show you gentlemen. Now, let me see if I get the right. There we go. Can you read that? This is a regional Emmy sent to our team for all of our coverage of the Thomas fire. So this is probably one of my favorite awards. And I've had, you know, I've had Associated Press Awards and things like that. But what I loved about this award was the fact that this is an award for team. It took a whole bunch of people. It took 50 plus people to do this and to win this. And so to me, even though these are actually not as hard to win as you might think, the regional ones, even though they look really cool. Uh, but this one to me was really important because it reflected all the members of our team who did all that hard work. And then were ultimately applauded by all the rich people in town. But at the time, you know, I thought this one makes sense. And this is, so I usually don't um, enter awards because I'm like, okay, well, they're nice and, and, and everything, but really should be all about just the, serving in the community and whatnot but that one for the whole team i was like yeah that's one that i want us to have and i'm really i was proud that we won that one what would you consider your second favorite award and i don't have it do i no i do not okay so way back this is a long time ago I got an award from, of all people, the Arizona City Managers Association. And it was a pretty cool award. I got, to, um, I got to go to this nice lunch and get the award. And it was really cool and everything. It was a statewide event. Um, and it was because we had decided to <laughs> uh, follow city crews around and see what they did all day. We would, we would park out by the city yard and when a crew left, we'd follow them and just see what they did all day. And some of them were kind of not, not doing much of anything. They just go somewhere and kind of putts around and, and you're like, okay. And, and I mean, it, it was boring to be honest with you, but you're like, these are people that my tax dollars are paying for. And so we put the story together. Uh, and, and I told you guys about how, when I got to these communities, I would go meet people to get, make sources and whatnot. And the person in Tucson who that was the operations manager was a man named Larry Price and Larry Price had been there forever. Larry, so I went and met him. He goes, you're the first TV reporter who's ever come to just see me without a camera. I said, oh yeah, I just want to meet you. Here's my business card. Because I'm obviously, since I'm going to be covering the city, I'm going to be talking to you about things over time. Okay, great. He actually helped me about two months after that when I was brand new in town. And there was this big story that was starting to break about the mayor was not going to run for re-election. He confirmed it for me, allowed me to get on air. And I looked really good to my boss. So I really liked him. He was a good guy. But I went to him and he goes, you know, I really, and I said, I'm sorry, but this is what we found. It was not that. He goes, okay. He goes, here's what we try to do to, to prevent that, this, 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 and this. Okay. He goes, but clearly we have more work to do. And I appreciate you letting me know. All right. Thank you very much. And so, you know, so, I mean, it could have been really confrontational and whatnot, 
it wasn't because I, I said, I'm not going to do the story until I've had your side of this and get your perspective and everything. And, and we, and when I put the story on, it included all of his comments in addition to what we found and everything. And people were like, Oh my God, what's, and he goes, no, we're going to, we're going to fix it. And they did as much as I think you ever could in a, any kind of, you know, big organization like that. But then, and that's why the, the award kind of makes me laugh is because out of the blue, the city managers association, which are the people who, you know, are the top guy or gal in a city. They were like, you know what? That really held us accountable. That, 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 that deserves an award. And I got this award. <laughs> and so I always kind of was impressed by it because it was like, I'm glad we did the story and it, uh, it, it was important and money is, you know, the spending of public money is a big deal. But the fact that, even the people who run cities realize that this was important. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I've gotten others. I've gotten awards from the Associated Press and United Press International, best spot news, best feature, you know, things like that. Um, but I would say, you know, the Thomas fire definitely just because of how, how much of a team effort it was. I've always, I've always liked it when, when uh, an organization I'm a part of, when it's like a best newscast best news operation in wisconsin uh the year actually i got fired <laughs> we won best news organization and best station of the year for the state of wisconsin which is which is why i make the caveat that my former boss was a football coach who just decided he wanted a different person it wasn't about what we were doing but those were really good awards to win too um has anyone in your family worked in the journal journalism industry? No, my dad was a railroad conductor. My granddaddy was a railroad conductor. That's on my dad's side. On my mom's side, my grandpa was a music teacher and band member playing the trumpet. And my grandmother was, you know, she didn't work. She was a housewife, but all she played the piano. But, and it was when I graduated high school or college, I think it was high school. My grandmother on my mom's side gave me a leather bound, and I still have it, a leather bound book of Shakespeare, of Shakespeare's works. And in it was a note she had written to me. And in it is her, um, the editor pin. I forget the name of the organization now. I'm, I'm, I should have looked that up for today. I apologize. But she wrote in there, that she thought that this should go to somebody in her family from one editor to another. Much love, grandma. Much love, much luck, grandma. And it would, but it was her, her, her pin for being an editor in her college. Pretty sure it was college. And I was just blown away. I had no idea that she had been an editor of her, I believe it was her yearbook. And that really impressed me. So I had actually asked my aunt about this. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, grandma was really big on, you know, she was that was she kind of was a, a budding journalist and whatnot in those days. But she just had kids and, you know, got married and became a housewife. And so that just kind of went away. But she kept all that stuff and then she passed it down to me. So, no, at least in the professional sense, but certainly in the uh, the spirit was there in my mom's and my mom's mom and my my maternal grandmother. In fact, one of the first words I ever learned to say was ball. And so th that set of grandparents were grandma and grandpa ball. So my grandma ball was an editor before I was. Oh, and at what point do you think your journalism career will end? My thought is, I've been giving a lot of thought to this. And my thought is probably right around the age of 67. I, I know many go longer. I think, though, that uh, if I can be set, you know, for retirement and all of those things, that's the time to uh, step aside and let someone else, you know, occupy my space and let someone else bring their skills and time and talent to the jobs that I've had. I think that's one that that should be is I think there should be a, a you know, retirement should be a legitimate thing. I also would, you know, on Facebook, I have many people who I'm friends with who are no longer in journalism that moved on to 
corporate communications, writing or whatever. And they all fight back and forth and argue up one side and down the other on politics and, you know, liberal and conservative and progressive and, you know, all socialists and all that. And I don't because that's not, I mean, I have opinions, of course, but that's not my, I'm not supposed to do that. I'd kind of like to be able to jump into some of those arguments and some of those conversations. And so that'll happen when I retire. They won't happen before that. My, my boss, one of the ones I've been, I was referring to you about, is very now opinionated, but he's retired. He has every right to his opinion. And I think he really enjoys giving it, to be honest with you. I had no idea about some of his opinions back when he was my boss, because it wasn't appropriate back then. Now it is. And so, so but I'm not, er, I'm not eager for it to happen. I'm not eager for that, that time to come, but I think I said about seven years from now. Uh, but it's going to, and when it does, that'll be okay. And I know that I will have had such a remarkable experience. I've experienced the highs, the highest highs, the lowest lows. I've been at the best of things. I've been at the worst of things. I got to ride with the Golden Knights Army Parachute Group in a plane, watch them jump out, which is wow, <laughs> you know. I've seen that and then I've been on the ground and seen them land. You know, uh, I've seen that. I have been at terrible stories with, I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen people who are deceased and I'll never forget what eyes look like when there's no life in them. It was one of those like, wow, I'll never forget this moment for the rest of my life because this person looked completely intact, but they were not living in this car that had wrecked on the freeway. I've seen that. I have seen everything from very glittery, fancy operate, you know, fancy uh, events with people wearing tuxes and fancy clothing. And I've seen people who have been in homeless shelters on Thanksgiving. I have seen people who fight and carry on and, and yell at each other over political issues. I've seen people who have been able to come together and create dinner tables with where hundreds of people along a big long table are, are eating dinner i've seen that it's i've been in cool old planes that were in the desert being mothballed and it used to be some of the nicest uh air 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 airplanes in the in the sky back in the day and now we're being retired i got to uh sit in a uh an American Airlines retrofitted plane with its brand new fancy, you know, first class seat because they were re re renovating these planes out in the desert near Tucson and do a story on what they were doing with these planes and how, what they look like. And they were pretty fancy, you know, I've lived in, in the islands where I got to, you know, be a part of all kinds of different types of, of stories. Uh, I got to go to the governor's mansion in Hawaii once when the Miss Universe pageant was there and walk a red carpet and with all these flash bulbs going off on you. And one of my reporters, I recognized, I couldn't see him <laughs> behind the, the bright lights. But it's like, Jim, Jim. And I look over and I wave and I'm like, this is crazy. You know, I've got to do that um, just because of my role at that time as a news executive in, in, in Hawaii. So when it, when it comes to the retirement time that'll be okay i mean i don't think it'll I, I if i if somebody ever hey could you come do something for us freelance or this sure of course i would be happy to but i don't expect that because the world is moving on and it's becoming your world all of you um and mine is to kind of just eventually get out of the way and let you do it that's kind of where it's coming to and that's okay i know that when the end comes that i will have done a lot of stuff. And while there's certainly things I regret, there's a heck of a lot more stuff that I'm really proud of. Yeah, I appreciate your outlook on that. That's very insightful. I've actually had time to think about it. <laughs> so I mean, I'm glad. You, and by the way, gents, I'm, and I'm glad you reminded me to say this. It's and you have, and that's great. Do not think you have to always submit questions and stick to them. You can go with any question you want as a journalist. If you hear something when you're talking to an interviewee 
uh, follow up on it. If you need clarity on something, you should do it. Don't think just because you you submitted some questions that that doesn't mean that anything else isn't fair game because it it is fair game. It should be. If somebody's agreed to be an interview, well, then they need to know that you're going to ask them, yeah, about X, Y, and Z, but you may ask them other things too. And that's okay and important. Has uh, this pandemic affected your journalism career in any way? Uh, it certainly affected the way we do what we do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my boss let me. I'm actually wearing, I'm, I'm, it's casual Friday, but it's also because I'm not a dress up suit and tie kind of guy anyway. But when, when it happened, we put as many people as we could remote. Fortunately, the technology has gotten to the point where many of our people could be remote. I still preferred to come in. A, I have an office. It has windows that look out into the newsroom, but I can be alone, so to speak. And I just rather be, you know, I all my stuff is here. My my desktop. I have a, a Mac Mini is my my computer, but I have the monitors, and I can watch monitor CNN, and all my programs are on the computer here. I have I could do stuff on the on the laptop at home, but I just preferred to be here. And, but I told my boss, I said, you know, the thing that will really help my mental health is if I can just wear like tees and, and cargo shorts to work. So for about a year, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great because then I didn't have to iron anything or go to the cleaners or anything like that. So that was pretty cool. But it was, it, it was difficult to um, make sure everyone understood. I do not expect you to put your health on the line in order to get a story. Your health is more important than getting the great interview with somebody. If you have to get the interview from a little further away with a little more hollow audio, I'll live with that. I said that many, many times. I repeated that over and over. If you need to be six feet away from somebody and the sound, the best sound we can get is from six feet away, we'll live with it. You know, I don't want anybody to put them. So, so I'm, it, yes, it was, it was challenging and yes, it was stressful. And yes, it was, uh, you know, frustrating that it was harder to get everything done. But at the end of the day, though, it was also, I'm glad that I was in a position to be able to make decisions that I knew were good for the team in the sense that I wasn't going to make them do anything stupid or anything crazy. And that I was the one making that call. Um, every day, you know, reporters can be like we were talking a minute ago, some of the worst and some of the best in, of life, but some of the worst can be dangerous. Some of the worst can be putting you in a situation where, you know, you're on a, on a dark street in the middle of the night and whatnot. Well, okay. Then you need to be near a cop or you need to be far away because no story is worth, you know, your life or getting hurt or, or whatever things like that. And I'm really glad to be in the position I'm in where I get to just easily, those are easy decisions for me. When I have to make a decision about the health and welfare and safety of my, my team, there's just, it's simple. It's just not complicated. Well, we're going to get that story and, and whatnot. Uh, I remember, uh, gosh, what year was it? About two years ago, uh, one of our reporters came back and had this amazing video driving through flames uh, from one of the fires. I forget which one. And I was like, oh, my God. And, and then I found out, oh, she was writing with the public information officer. Whew. Okay, fine. And then I had to explain it to my boss because I knew this was going to go up and people are going to be like, I'm like, no, no, it's fine. She was with so-and-so. That guy knows his shit really fine. He's good. She was, in very, she was very safe. She just happened to have her iPhone open and getting this amazing video going down the road. And, but I had to like, but my reaction was the exact reaction my boss had and my bosses a corporate had, which is again, one of the reasons why I love working here because they're all about our people first. And so when I realized, and I realized, okay, well, good. They're not thinking they have to go off and do crazy things. They just happened to get something really good because they were in a place where they could get it safely. That was awesome. And did get it, had the presence of mind to make sure they, they captured it when they could safely. Uh, but at the same time, everyone's reaction and management was like, until, oh, good. Oh, really? That's really good video, you know, kind of thing. Once that it was made clear that they were safe, it wasn't a problem. 
Okay, good. Then it was like, wow, that's really awesome. And you know, it was a great video. It made really Im impressive and compelling television. <laughs> So as we wrap up this interview, I just wanted to ask if you, if there's some things you would like to share with upcoming journalists who might come across in the future and maybe some advice or some life lessons that you have learned throughout your career. Always be transparent. Always, you know, try not to have an agenda. We're human beings, that's hard. And if you're covering a story that directly impacts you your family a loved one friends you know it's hard sometimes but as a journalist your job is to try to get as much information from all perspectives as you can and then to convey that in whatever form you're doing it whether it's print media digital video whatever it is so try to maintain that standard of objectivity as much as you can be honest with yourself when you know that it's something that uh, you know you have biases about and and be transparent look i know that this is something that this has caused really big trouble for this community and i'm a part of that community and so that means it causes trouble for me too but i'm going to do everything i can to present this as fairly and accurately um, as i can so that's one thing. And that's hard. And I do believe that journalists need to be careful on social media. Uh, <laughs> old school saying, but the internet is written in ink, not pencil. You can't erase it. It'll always be there in one form or another, whatever you, you publish online, it's going to be there. Uh, someone's going to have saved it. Someone's going to have screen grabbed it, even if it's deleted, even if it's taken off, it still lives somewhere. It just does. That's just the reality. So if you go into your, your world knowing that and self-editing yourself about what you post on your own social media and your, your digital platforms, the better off you're going to be. Because it's, it's bad enough when you look back on your, your younger days and, you know, you see the things you did that were kind of crazy and maybe not so smart just because that's life. That's one thing. But when you actively engage, publish, write, take pictures of something that's it. And you do it yourself. Like you go ahead and put something on, on, well, now you, you got to own it. And that's a lot of pressure. So I think if people can be a little more thoughtful and maybe even, dare I say, conservative in what they share and, and post and on, on their digital platforms, the better off they're probably going to be as a journalist. That's the thing. It's the, as a, this is all about as a journalist, not about a human being. This is all about as a journalist. Because unless you're going to go off and be a, an opinion writer, Okay, well, then knock yourself out and post whatever you want. But if you're not, if you're going to be covering anything from, you know, from politics to crime to economics, and you've posted something that clearly is really slanted one way or another in any of those fields, well, then what are you going to do when somebody finds it and then says, hey, how, what about this? And how can I trust you? How can I believe that you know what you're bringing to the table and your and your writing and your copy is is legit. So I think it's important to be careful. I also think it's important to be careful um, in it being a little more professional. Um, I think the 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 selfies with the keg are problematic, <laughs> you know. And maybe I'm just maybe I'm just an old fogey. I don't know, but. I just think that kind of stuff like that, I think it's, you have to be careful. And uh, there's one thing about, you know, pictures around a, at a party with a group of friends and everybody's having a good time and pictures where you look like you're doing something really stupid or you're doing something really inappropriate at the wrong place. If you're goofing off at a place that's really serious, well, that's not very appropriate. And that's not going to help your credibility as a journalist. So you know, things to be thinking about, things to be keeping in mind, I think, uh, 
once you are not a journalist anymore, well then, you know, knock yourself out and, you know, let your freak flag fly, but you know, be whatever. And, uh, I just think that as a journalist, though, you have to, it is about trying to have a, the kind of reputation where people go, hey, you know what? So and so plays it straight. And that's what matters is that they're, you know, they're not out to get me. They're not out to make me look bad. They're, they're trying to be fair. And that's all you can ever ask it, it, is anybody to say back to you, you know what? You treated me fairly. I may not have agreed with all the people you interviewed, but you treated me fairly that works i can handle that that i will take hope that helps you guys <laughs> yeah thank you so much for this interview i mean we got a chance to interview you and i can't say i can only say for myself i can't say for the rest of my interviewers but i found it very engaging i found it very helpful and insightful it's great getting to look into your mind and getting to know you oh thank you well and if you have other questions just shoot me an email and i'll get back to you as quick as i can but i'm I appreciate the opportunity and I was very really honored by your professor to, uh, to do this. So I'm glad we got a chance to. Hope it didn't take too much of your time today though. But it's fine. It's you. fine. I told folks, I said, Hey, between X and X, I'm going to be a little bit. So, but I'll probably have like a, like I've got 17 emails at least since we started. So we'll see what those are all about. <laughs> well, you gentlemen all have a good weekend. You too. Have a great week. You, right, you do the same. Thank you for your Thank time. You very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time.